So yeah, my name is uh, Chris Cox. I, uh, I'm also here in Boulder with the Cooperative Institute for Research and Environmental Sciences and uh, uh, NOAA Earth System Research Laboratory, the Physical Science Division. Um, I was asked to give a, a brief update on de-ice today, the de-icing comparison experiment. This will be uh, an AGU poster presentation uh, Friday afternoon. For those of you who may be uh, attending AGU, come stop by, say hello, A53G. Um, and uh, I suppose, I, yeah, I'd like to also acknowledge uh, Sarah Morris, who's the co-lead on this project, and really the entire de-ice team a few dozen people in some sense. A lot of people are contributing to this. I'll get back to those folks at the end. Um, this is an ongoing campaign we started up in August and where uh, uh, we will run through until next August. Uh, the problem that we're trying to address here involves icing of radiometer domes. So broadband radiation stations uh, make basic instrument, uh, or sorry, make basic measurements of the long wave and short wave fluxes uh, around the globe every day. Uh, one of the major issues with these, uh, these stations involves for cold climates, uh, snow, rime, and frost, which build up on the sensor domes. You can see some examples. Um, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor or not, but along the top of the, uh, in the images along the top here, there's these glass domes. Uh, ice builds up on that and it, uh, uh, it impacts the measurements. It impacts it in significant ways and fairly complex ways. It impacts both the long wave and the short wave. In some cases, it can enhance the measurement or the signal. In some cases, it can damp it. And uh, it frequently, it takes the form in the signal of looking like a cloud. And so it can be quite difficult also to remove in post-processing. Um, an example where it's uh, quite easily identifiable in data is shown below. Uh, in this time series from a couple weeks in March 2015 from the high Arctic in Canada. Um, this is the downwelling long wave. So high values are cloudy, low values are clear sky. And over at the beginning of the time series, there's, uh, there's some red dots which um, show these curves. And these are effectively growth curves of frost that you're seeing. So as the frost is growing on the dome, it's contributing more radiance to the signal and it's increasing the signal and it's doing so artificially. Where the arrows are, it's punctuated by this sharp decrease that's quite sudden. Um, that's the time when the, the technician comes out for their daily cleaning. They clean the ice off the domes and it reduces the signal in this case by 20 or 30 watts per meter squared. Um, if these had de-iced themselves, the signal would be much more physical looking and it would be very difficult to distinguish from the signal of a cloud. Um, this, this bias instantaneously can be tens of watts per meter squared, but it's pretty frequent, so it can be uh, over a long period of time um, uh, in the annual average at a, a site that's severely impacted, maybe five or 10 watts per meter squared in the annual average. Uh, also, even if we can screen it out, um, it occurs under particular meteorological conditions, so it's, it constitutes a climatological bias. What we really want to do is find a way to mitigate it, to prevent it from forming in the first place. This is a problem that's been as, uh, old as making radiation measurements. It's been recognized for a very long time. And um, uh, the baseline surface radiation network, this premier network, global network of uh, radiometric measurements from the surface has been thinking about this for quite some time and has been talking about uh, ways of uh, testing de-icing strategies. There have been a lot of uh, independent stakeholders um, uh, associated with commercial vendors, individual research researchers, research institutes, that have developed uh, mitigation strategies over time, uh, largely in parallel, largely independently. And they, uh, uh, they've been moving in the direction more of looking at heating and ventilation. Uh, and in particular, the ventilation component of, component of that is being a viable solution. Um, so at the last BSRN meeting in spring 2016, I took over the Cold Climates Working Group and uh, we committed at that time to, uh, to take on this problem and evaluate the systems. We're not producing new systems or new ideas, but we're testing the ideas that have already been presented. Um, so the, uh, uh, again, our focus here is on heating and ventilation, although um, heating is tricky because it, uh, you can't just throw heat at these measurements. They, they're sensitive to temperature and stability. So um, the ventilation part is, is really, uh, sort of intriguing, in particular in light of uh, uh, projects like what Matt will talk about in the next talk, 
uh, where there's an interest in deploying these sorts of systems autonomously in remote locations, unmanned stations, and therefore um, uh, low power solutions become uh, uh, particularly important. Uh, DICE has a website um, that's shown on the front page so over to the left, the URL in the bottom right. That website has lots of information, contact information, uh, real-time data, and um, uh, webcam imagery, quick looks, uh, details about the design itself, uh, et cetera, uh, are available there. So I encourage you to go check it out. Um, after that BSRN meeting, we spent about six to nine months designing the experiment, reaching out to uh, to institutes to collect contributions um, to, uh, to be tested. Uh, we did that through winter 2016, 2017, and then in June of 2017, we, we collected all of the radiometers that would be included and we calibrated them all together here in Boulder at the, uh, uh, at the roof of the Ezreal lab. That's what's shown in the picture here. Uh, and then in August, uh, we deployed uh, to the Baseline Atmospheric Observatory, NOAA's observatory in uh, Utkiakvik, Alaska, formerly Barrow. Um, I'm sure all of you are familiar with this location. If you're not, it's coastal, about 73 and, or sorry, 71 and a half degrees north or so. Um, it's a really excellent location uh, for the types of icing that we're looking to test. And that's one of the reasons why we're there. We also have uh, a lot of logistical reasons for being there uh, working with NOAA. But um, additionally, there's a, a great uh, many measurements uh, that are being made in this area, either by the NOAA Observatory or by the uh, Department of Energy's Atmospheric Radiation Measurement Program, which is uh, the observatory next door, if you will. So there's a wealth of atmospheric and cloud uh, data being collected here. Uh, additionally, the Baseline Surface Radiation Network um, station operated by NOAA uh, now in its third decade is, uh, is also being measured um, integrated essentially into this platform now. Um, so we've integrated de-ice into a long legacy of quality radiometric measurements in the Arctic. The, uh, the platform design has a lot of details. Obviously, I'm not going to go over all of those details, but maybe some basic statistics. We've got 21 pyranometers. Those are the short wave measurements. Five pergeometers. Those are the long wave. Of those 26, um, five are digital. The rest are analog. Uh, there are 26 individual de-icing systems also being tested, and that's basically various configurations of around 15 different systems, depending on how you differentiate what is a unique system. Um, we're measuring meteorology at the table itself. That complements the station meteorology. Uh, we have high resolution uh, security cameras that are measuring or uh, that are collecting images every 15 minutes uh, of the whole table. Uh, throughout the year. And uh, uh, again, all of that data is being collected and is available on the, the website, basically in real time. Uh, we're also collaborating with the Department of Energy ARM program, who have set up a similar camera uh, set up at both the NSA observatory that's about half a kilometer from the de-ice platform, and also um, at, uh, at their Liktok Point observatory about 250 kilometers to the east. So they have cameras pointing at their uh, radiometric stations uh, with the, the de-icing um, strategies that are being deployed at, at those stations. Uh, since we're pretty early in experiment, I don't really have anything quantitative to say in, in the way of results, but um, there, there have been some really uh, nice developments so far. For one thing, we've seen the types of, uh, we've got some great case studies. We've seen the types of, um, uh, of icing events that we've been looking for. An example here is a frost event that occurred on October 10th. It may be difficult on your screens to see some of the ice because it's, it's just a light frost event, but on the bottom left, uh, I've zoomed in on a couple of radiometers. You can see um, this ice capping one of the domes where the other one uh, next to it, it, it remains clear. Uh, so that's the second uh, sort of preliminary conclusion here is that not only are we seeing the, the types of events we're looking for, but the, the, the different systems are responding in variable ways, uh, which is interesting. Um, it really points to subtleties in, in the importance of the engineering for these designs because uh, essentially they're all deploying the same approach, which is some combination of heating and ventilation and know the difference between the, the ones that are performing well and not performing well is not the addition of heat. 
it's more complicated than that. Uh, a somewhat more dramatic event that we saw on November 30th is uh, a freezing fog came through and, and we have this heavy rime event uh, showing some pictures of an example from that. Um, again, same conclusion that there's, there's a variable response from, from the instruments. And uh, if I go into the next here, hopefully this shows up on everyone's screen. This is a GIF of uh, half hour images from one of those cameras during that event uh, over the course of maybe 12 or 14 hours. I'm not sure exactly how long it was. Um, you can see the, uh, the rhyme developing, uh, and then you can see uh, the aftermath. And some of the radiometers are staying clear. Some of them iced up quite significantly, and some of them um, uh, de-iced themselves after being iced. And I want to draw your attention to the bottom right part of this, uh, this little movie where there's uh, two systems that look pretty much identical, and they are almost identical. Um, one of them stays clear and one of them ices up. And the only real difference, and then it de-ices itself uh, kind of toward the end of, end of the movie. The only difference between this is that the one uh, at the, that stays clear at the very bottom right, that shield, that platform that sits around the dome is raised up a millimeter or two with some washers. Uh, everything else is, is absolutely the same. And so it, it, it's just a subtle difference in the way that the air is directed across the dome that, that made that difference. Um, just to wrap up, the uh, uh, first, I, I'll plug the, the poster again. So if you're, uh, if you're at AGU, please do come by and introduce yourself. It'd be great to meet some of you. Uh, who I don't already know. And um, uh, I have a lot of people to thank. There, there's, uh, you know, Sarah and I have, have led this project, but in every way, this has been a community project. It, and uh, it's, um, uh, we've done this at PSD with pretty bare bones budget, actually. And it's really been a lot of in kind contributions coming in from around the world from commercial vendors, from research institutes, uh, loaning systems, loaning radiometers. Uh, as well as a lot of individuals loaning, um, uh, lending their, their uh, expertise, their engineering expertise, their scientific expertise. Um, and in, in particular, uh, I'll, I'll thank Brian Thomas and Ross uh, Bergener, who, who are the uh, techs that run the, the, the Barrow Observatory. They're the folks that keep this thing going on a daily basis, and they've done a fantastic job for us. I really appreciate it. Uh, so that's it for my presentation. I can turn it back over to Heist now. Yeah, Chris, thanks very much. I think um, there are a lot of people on this call that are probably very interested in what you're up to up there. And um, it's really good to see a, a good group attending because I think this is an update that's very valuable for a lot of people. Um, so I'll say uh, if there are any quick questions for Chris at this point, feel free to ask them. And maybe while we're doing that, we can shift the screen over to Matt, Sarah. Okay. Can anyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, this is this is Rang Shai. Um, so, are all the instruments parameters uh, from Kippenzonen, or were there any Epley parameters? Yeah, there's a mixture. There are some from Kippenzonen. There are some from Epley. There are also some from Huxaflux. Uh, some from EKO. Uh, so, Huxaflux is uh, from the Netherlands. Uh, EKO is from Japan, and. Uh, Delta T, a UK company, has uh, a couple instruments up there as well. I think I got everybody. So were they, um, the uh, date traces uh, somewhat similar? Were you able to get similar uh, uh, irradiance values at the surface for both all these parameters? Yeah. When they yeah. Were, um, yeah. So in some sense, that's kind of by design in the, the sense of, uh, all except for the digital ones were calibrated together. Um, so they were calibrated on the same table at the same time, um, uh, as opposed to using the factory calibrations. But even the factory calibrations, these instruments were measuring quite close to one another. So uh, one of the outcomes I'm hoping to have from this, uh, this experiment, uh, if, we, if we hope that uh, some of the instruments stay de-iced most of the time is that uh, we'll be able to have a fairly complete annual cycle of uh, radiometric measurements with pretty well-defined uh, uh, radiometric uncertainties to uh, offer as a, uh, as a data set um, in support of YOP, for instance, that 
Um, you know, that maybe that's not a certainty at this point, but it's a, it's a secondary objective that I hope that we'll be able to contribute. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you both. Um, I think we have to move on in order to get the rest of the agenda in today, but if other people have questions, I strongly encourage you to either reach out to Chris directly or um, find him at his AGU poster if you're going to be in New Orleans next week. So next we have um, Matt Shoup, who's going to give an overview of uh, Mosaic and the status update on that project. So go ahead, Matt. Uh, great, thanks. Uh, let me know if you can't hear me. Um, so we, this is not an AGU presentation, but um, we thought it was uh, a timely, uh, timely to provide a little update uh, since Mosaic does play so uh, favorably into the atmosphere team and milestones. Uh, and so I'll just go through a little update and, and uh, it's specifically motivated by some workshops we've had uh, recently. So this is one slide on what Mosaic is. I think that most people probably know, but just the one slide is we're going to take the ship, the Polar Stern from Germany and freeze it in the Arctic sea ice for a full year. And that's going to serve as uh, this kind of drifting station along with the sea ice to look at coupled processes in the atmosphere, the sea ice, the ocean, uh, biogeochemistry and ecosystem, so kind of the physical, chemical, and biological processes of that sea ice. Uh, in the slide, we kind of see a drift trajectory uh, around that ship as it drifts. There'll be a distributed network uh, of observations, uh, buoys, autonomous sensors, uh, etc., providing some spatial context. Uh, and over the course of the year, there'll be some aircraft measurements made. There'll be some resupply missions uh, from other icebreakers. So that's the very brief uh, um, overview. It's, a, it's going to be a year-long project in the ice from fall of 2019 to uh, 2020. I'm happy to engage other people if there for the questions about what the details are. Um, but since I've presented here before, I'm just going to go on with the, the, the more updates. And the updates really are, are coming out of some recent workshops. There's been three in the last uh, you know, couple months here. Uh, one, there was an aircraft campaigns workshop in uh, early October uh, in Leipzig, Germany where we had about 50 people there, and we're talking about aircraft campaigns that are uh, nominally coordinated uh, with the Mosaic timeframe. So most of these will happen in uh, 2020, spanning from the kind of early spring uh, all the way through the end of summer. So a lot of activities there, some of, the, some of which are just proposed right now, some are committed already. Uh, so that was a, a very nice workshop there. It's the first, um, there will be future workshops uh, for that community. Um, there was an ice camp planning uh, workshop in uh, early November in Bremerhaven, and this was kind of a, a smaller team effort, but planning uh, the, the distribution of assets that will be down on the ice near the ship to really start to get a handle on uh, how do we install those things, uh, how do we deconflict, and um, how do we coordinate what we're doing, uh, and then we talked some about drift planning. I'll show a little bit about that in a minute. Um, and then uh, the biggest one was an implementation workshop that was recently held a couple of weeks ago in St. Petersburg, Russia. Uh, this one had about 120 people at it, and actually we had to, to restrict the number. There was just too many people, and there's a lot of excitement about this uh, mosaic right now. And, and um, lesson learned, I think we'll have uh, more uh, space in the future. Um, but this uh, workshop had a lot of um, high-level logistics uh, discussions. Uh, I guess a lot of this happened in, in kind of back rooms, if you will, with uh, important uh, players associated with some of the major logistics. Um, there was a lot of detailed science coordination uh, with a variety of our sub teams uh, discussing the different uh, aspects of Mosaic. Uh, there was a lot of focus on modeling with some presentations and some discussions and breakouts. Uh, we talked about scheduling of major activities uh, and things like, you know, how do we put everything together on a ship or in a camp together? Uh, so these are some important discussions that we'll have to continue having in the, in the coming uh, years as we move towards the, the deployment. So just a few slides here to, to kind of show some of the, the kind of higher level uh, outcomes of some of these workshops. Uh, one is planning. So the, the, the schedule for the actual activity in the field, uh, nominally this is for a, a year in the field and we're starting to hone in on uh, some of the details of how that will manifest. Uh, there will be six different legs for people to be out there. Uh, and in between those legs, there will be some resupply missions from a variety of other icebreakers from different nations. There'll be some uh, you know, swapping of crew so that scientists and, and crew can come and go. Uh, and so we're starting to, to move in and hone in on a, a kind of a very detailed schedule. And so, of course, this is still uh, tentative at this point, but we're, we've, we're taking nice steps forward in, in putting together what this, uh, this cruise will actually look like. Um, the drift, this is uh, of a lot of interest to a lot of people. Of course, it impacts the science, it impacts the logistics. 
Uh, it will be challenging to forecast this. Um, this is actually one of the things that as a science community, we're interested in improving our ability to, to understand drifts through the Arctic. Um, there's been a lot of work to use uh, observations over the past um, 12 to 14 years uh, and look at different uh, starting locations and how uh, a ship that would be installed there might drift with the ice pack. And so uh, this is one manifestation of that. All the different squiggles on this plot show different uh, years of drift. If you started at that circle um, and you can see the months is, are, are in color. And this is one location that's close to maybe where we'll start uh, the drift, uh, potentially a little further east. Um, but each of these drifts, you know, starting locations we've looked at, you know, what are the, the chances of drifting into the Russian economic zone, which we'd, we'd like to not do that. Um, what are the chances of staying in the sea ice the whole, the whole year? Uh, what are the drift speeds? Where do we end up? Things like that. So there's been a lot of planning in this direction. Um, there's been a lot of kind of implementation design discussion. These are just a couple schematics here. There's, um, you know, we're, we're talking about the ship a lot and there, there's going to be a lot of equipment on the ship. Where do we put that equipment? Um, what's the optimal placement of different containers, different observing systems? So there's been a, a great deal of discussion there. Um, the ice camp next to the ship, this diagram to the left, is kind of a schematic at this point. There'll be a lot of assets out on the ice near the ship in a camp, uh, and those will be supporting a variety of different um, activities, both looking at the atmosphere, the ice, the ocean, making samples, uh, looking at snow, uh, et cetera. And so we've done a lot of planning there. And then up in the upper right-hand corner here, uh, distributed network. This has been a little bit evolving as we understand what assets we'll have, uh, but this is basically the, the polar stern is the dot in the middle. Uh, and it, you know, in, different ranges extending out from the polar stern, there'll be a variety of other assets, different buoys, uh, autonomous stations. Uh, and so we're honing in on, on a design for what that will look like. From the atmosphere side, since this is the atmosphere team, uh, just a, a brief uh, update. Well, I would say that we're in quite good shape. Um, we have most of the, obviously the major components covered right now through uh, a combination of some pretty significant contributions, uh, the DOE arm, uh, program has made a very nice contribution uh, of a mobile facility. Uh, Alfred Wegener Institute is um, providing a lot of support for radio sounds and, uh, and other kinds of sounding devices. Uh, the NSF has made a contribution. Um, the Tropos Institute from uh, Germany has made a nice contribution and the U University of Helsinki. These are all uh, funded activities at this point. Um, there are a few gaps and, and other things that we're trying to fill in. So there's a, a little bit of a gap in some wind profiling. Um, but we have some nice proposals from uh, colleagues in the UK and Germany uh, that are moving forward. Uh, there are some gaps in our aerosol observing. And again, we have some proposals from the US here and uh, Switzerland among some, uh, potentially some other nations to fill those gaps. Uh, and unmanned aircraft systems uh, would really like to have some observations of those natures there. And there's, again, US, UK, and Finland uh, proposals are being uh, assembled and, and considered right now to fill those gaps. So in general, I think from the atmosphere observational side, we're in really good shape. Uh, with putting together our complement, uh, and it's quite a sophisticated set of observations. Um, also, there was a lot of focus during this, this recent implementation workshop on modeling, and I'm not going to go through this whole schematic here. This is a schematic that the modeling team put together of a variety of ways that uh, modeling activities support Mosaic kind of on the lead into the, the campaign and, and during the operational time, and then also using the data afterwards to all funnel towards our kind of synthesis and advancing our knowledge. Um, I will make a point, though, that there is a table that's being formulated by the, the, the coordinators for the modeling team. And right now it has about, I think a little more than 100 entries in that table of discrete activities that the modeling community plans to do or wants to do around Mosaic, many of which are, have some funding already, many of which are aspirational. But it just goes to show that this is going to have a, a lot of impact on the modeling community. Uh, and, and the community is really stepping forward and, and kind of voicing and, and you know, solidifying some of their vision for what uh, this will actually do for that community. So that's a really nice progress there. From the U.S. side, just a nice uh, uh, update of U.S. contributions. Uh, I mentioned the Department of Energy Atmospheric Radiation Measurement Program and their mobile facility. Um, that uh, was really the first uh, major commitment to the, the campaign. It's really been a nucleus around which a lot of other activities have been uh, supported now. And the NSF has um, funded so far four projects. Um, some of these are these kind of multi-institution collaborations. Uh, you can see them listed there. Um, there are a number of other activities that are under consideration right now, other proposals at, at NSF uh, as well. 
Um, NOAA is supporting um, some of the development of some autonomous flux stations related to some of the stuff that Chris just talked about. Um, and NOAA is also going to support some kind of quasi-operational sea ice forecasting over the course of the Mosaic timeframe. Uh, I have a, a, a line here for ONR. While not directly um, a mosaic activity, the ONR is going to have uh, their thin ice project happening on the same time frame where the, they'll be in the same area looking at uh, some kind of larger scale uh, storms, uh, kind of synoptic scale features um, on down to, you know, polar cyclones and then polar lows and, and processes like that. Uh, and then there's a number of other, other things under consideration uh, through uh, the ASR program at DOE, uh, NSF. NASA, other activities like that. So um, I would expect that the list of US contributions will grow uh, in, in the coming years. And lastly, just to summarize with a few other key details, um, there are many nations involved. I've, I've put up a list here and those in bold have resources already on the table in the form of funded projects, dedicated funding calls that will fund, fund projects, things like that. And, and the ones that are not in bold are, um, we have, activities moving forward there and people pursuing funding. So quite a lot of uh, involvement from different nations. Um, there's also a lot of key coordinated activities that are moving forward. So since we've put Mosaic forward, there's been a whole community step forward to, to have T Mosaic, which is the terrestrial mosaic, uh, and C Mosaic, which is coastal processes mosaic. So whole different research communities that are interested in engaging on the same time frame to really leverage the mosaic observations for other purposes and, and other scientific questions. Um, additionally, there's a whole activity around Comble and Caesar. These are focused on cold air outbreaks in the northern Atlantic side of the, of the Arctic. Um, the funding status for those is not certain yet, but it would, um, uh, that would bring a whole lot of other assets further to the south that would link very nicely with Mosaic. Uh, and I already mentioned the ONR thin ice activity. Uh, and lastly, there's been some recent engagement from space agencies, especially in Europe so far, uh, where they're making investments in some of the ground assets to really uh, solidly build up uh, some infrastructure for uh, ground validation of different satellite platforms. So Mosaic is shaping up to be a, 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 you know, a very uh, unprecedented project in terms of the comprehensiveness and overall impact. I welcome you to look at the, the webpage where you can get all kinds of information. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Matt. Um, again, I, I encourage uh, people to reach out to Matt directly. If there are any very quick questions right now, we can take one of those. Otherwise, we will move on to the shorter presentations. Okay, thank you. I do appreciate that there are a lot of people here who I think have been aware of Mosaic, but it's great to be able to have these continued updates as we move along uh, to keep people informed and to hopefully have Matt give one update instead of 20 to 20 different people. Uh, it's nice to be able to do this in more of a community setting. So thank you, Matt. Okay, our next uh, three presentations will be um, given as uh, kind of short summaries of AGU presentations. Certainly we're hoping that these aren't the full AGU presentations to save some exciting things for the meeting itself. But um, uh, the first speaker here will be Leonid Yurganov from uh, University of Maryland, Baltimore County. And so Leonid, please go ahead and uh, give us your presentation. Hello, good afternoon. Hi. Good afternoon. Sorry. It doesn't work. Leonid, we can see your screen now. Ah, okay. Okay. I can find, cannot find first slide. Okay. Now I'm going to first slide. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, I'm Leonid Jurganov, uh, and uh, our team is uh, funded by NASA. And we focus on methane, on the Arctic methane, uh, using satellite data. This uh, report, uh, as well as uh, two uh, papers, uh, one of them is published, another one is under re review, uh, motivated uh, by uh, this uh, blue curve. Uh, this is uh, NOAA data from 2000, here actually uh, earlier uh, up to now. And we see uh, that 
uh, methane, global methane, global surface methane was rather stable until 2007, then uh, increased uh, with the rate of five ppb per, per year, and then increased, uh, uh, then uh, the rate uh, doubles up to 10 after 2014. Uh, when I look into our uh, satellite data, I found very similar picture. And uh, so we can consider this as experimental fact uh, that uh, uh, methane uh, behavior uh, dramatically changed uh, in 2014. And we need to find out, we need to find out what happens and especially uh, what happens uh, in the Arctic. Uh, for Arctic, we have two, uh, two approaches to measure methane. One of them is uh, using, uh, is using uh, solar radiation, and another one is using uh, thermal infrared radiation, in other words, uh, outgoing long-term radiation. Uh, and uh, IASI, uh, as a, uh, a spectrometer of uh, in TIR, TIR is quite good for that uh, goal. Uh, we, uh, uh, you, you see uh, uh, annual mean for uh, lower part of the troposphere between zero and four kilometers. And uh, uh, this is concentration. Uh, this uh, and if we compare with all the data uh, for uh, uh, solar uh, uh, reflected radiation, we have a, we see a gap over the Arctic as well as Antarctic due to uh, no sun. Uh, but uh, we are concentrated not not on the concentration, but on a uh, constant co on a contrast between concentration. Uh, in the Arctic and uh, over a uh, background area. So this anomaly uh, is uh, over uh, the uh, sea, over the Barents Sea, where uh, no uh, ice, uh, where no ice in winter time. <coughs> this makes uh, these measurements possible because uh, this uh, approach needs uh, warm surface and cold air. And this uh, condition is met over the Arctic. So these data are quite reliable. And what we see, we see anomaly uh, in winter time. Anomaly in winter time over uh, the Barents Sea. It's uh, uh, for this square. And <clears throat> uh, why uh, it happens? Uh, zero anomaly in summertime and maximum anomaly uh, in uh, winter time. Uh, we can compare with uh, MLD that uh, is, uh, that is uh, uh, mixed layer depth. So zero, uh, that means uh, uh, no, uh, uh, no uh, flux bit of methane uh, uh, course, uh, corresponds to no flux uh, of methane from uh, the sea to uh, uh, air to the troposphere. And uh, in winter time, uh, uh, the uh, MLD is uh, almost uh, all entire uh, water column. That means the mixing of uh, very good and we have a good uh, uh, flux from the sea to the atmosphere. This flux probably uh, is uh, uh, from uh, the bottom, from the seabed, where uh, some deposits of uh, methane hydrates uh, are a flux, uh, are a source of methane. And what happens uh, with uh, years? In, with years, we see 2010, 2011, 2000. Uh, 12 and during this period of uh, methane in uh, November, December was uh, low methane anomaly. After that, it was increasing and uh, maximum was uh, observed in 2016, November, December. 
and uh, most interesting uh, that not only uh, uh, the uh, magnitude of this anomaly increased but also uh, the uh, area uh, increased and uh, pr practically uh, and very low uh, emission in uh, the currency changed for uh, very significant emission in currency so something changes uh, what for uh, but for uh, 2017 for uh, november 2017 we uh, we see uh, some diminution some uh, going uh, methane emission methane anomaly going down a little bit so it's uh, not uh, don't think don't uh, look it doesn't look as a, a continuous one and we also we can compare uh, of uh, methane from the arctic ocean with uh, methane from uh, the uh, terrestrial areas also very uh, very uh, um, clear very clear increase from 2010 to 2016 uh, uh, comparing uh, the anomaly between sea and land we can uh, we can uh, uh, make the conclusion that uh, uh, flux from the sea is approximately one third of the flux from the land uh, and uh, it uh, is a base for further conclusions about the contribution of uh, sea and land into the methane flux but most interesting that uh, the time when uh, that uh, that uh, anomaly that uh, changed from uh, low values to current high values uh, was approximately around 2013 2014 so uh, contribution of arctic both land and sea is significant for this global picture uh, but uh, uh, to our opinion contribution of land is more than contribution of uh, of uh, the uh, land and this is also for land uh, this uh, change is also confirmed by uh, gosat uh, uh, satellite that uh, measures the reflected solar light from uh, from west siberia and as conclusions, uh, we can consider two main options. Uh, one is uh, direct option temperature growth, methane growth. It, uh, it is well known that 80% uh, of methane is of biological microbial uh, production. Uh, so the temperature dependence is quite normal. But also there may be another option that uh, methane as a uh, greenhouse gas uh, uh, as a greenhouse gas uh, 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 increases uh, temperature uh, surface uh, and air temperature uh, so uh, it uh, is uh, it may be both uh, uh, both options and not quite clear what happens now we can look for example at uh, the most recent uh, 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 values of temperature it's it's uh, uh, black points and uh, line and uh, and methane also uh, this uh, te the temperature is from uh, from uh, um, uh, Goddard uh, Institute uh, Hansens actually was the director of this um, institute and uh, now it's going on also and we see it very nice uh, very nice um, agreement between uh, temperature growth and methane growth uh, also but uh, CO2 also uh, changed in 2000 16 uh, now actually 2000 uh, 
16 years, but uh, uh, methane changed uh, earlier. So it uh, uh, it uh, gives us some uh, uh, some data to think about. Uh, my short contribution, uh, short uh, talk is over, and uh, thank you very much. And these are uh, uh, papers submitted, uh, papers uh, published and submitted about this topic. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Leonid. Uh, unfortunately, we, we don't have time to take questions right now, but as with the other speakers, I would encourage uh, questions to go directly to the speaker. Um, our next presentation is going to be given by Lance Mora. Leonid, you need to stop sharing your screen now. Oh, thank you. Okay, thank you. Mm. And she's going to discuss uh, some work that she's been doing on aerosol cloud interactions, if I remember correctly. Hi, can you guys see my screen and hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so I am going to be talking about uh, how aerosols are affecting clouds over the Arctic Ocean. Um, this is a very important problem because we don't know a lot about, well, we know that clouds are, have a very large impact on, on um, heat fluxes in the ocean, uh, over the Arctic, and um, we don't really have a good handle on how aerosols are affecting clouds over the Arctic. Um, in this talk, I'm going to be specifically focusing on nighttime clouds, and the reason for that is because uh, I'm mo mostly right now we're trying to get a handle in, in our work on microphysical effects from the aerosols. And so during the nighttime, we, we have reduced confounding effects from direct aerosol effects and semi-direct aerosol effects. Um, so just to give you a little bit of background on kind of the methods of what we're doing, um, we're comparing clouds and different aerosol uh, concentrations. Uh, so this is kind of a cartoon to give you an idea of, of what we're doing. So, so imagine you're looking at, down at the Arctic from above. Some of the clouds that you see are going to be clean clouds, um, and some of them are going to be clouds present in very strong aerosol layers. And then some of the clouds are going to be somewhere in between. They're not really clean clouds per se, but they're not exactly present in heavily aerosol layers either. So when you're looking down at, above, at the Arctic from above, this is what you see. So what we're doing is we're, we're, we're trying to isolate um, the differences between all the clouds and specifically the clean clouds. So the difference between these two is an estimate of the aerosol cumulative regional and direct effects on cloud properties. Um, so this metric is useful because it directly relates to surface effects. Um, and all, or, or observable surface effects, I mean. And it also it's a lot likely right now to be more accurate than current models of this process because cloud models in the Arctic at the moment aren't, uh, aren't quite sufficient. Um, it, it doesn't explicitly exclude meteorological covariation, but which is generally a problem when you're trying to isolate aerosol effects from, um, from meteorology. But because we're looking at the average across an entire region, local scale, um, meteorological covariation is reduced. Um, so for this to work, we need large sample size, and that's why we're using remote sensing data sets. Uh, ideally, you have meteorological data to show that the clean clouds are otherwise comparable. And more, most importantly, you need some way to correctly identify the clean clouds. And in the Arctic, using remote sensing data, it's very difficult to get aerosol um, con con concentrations, particularly at nighttime, and also over sea ice. And so to get, um, to get kind of a consistent value for, that's comparable across all the clouds, we use the FlexPart aerosol transport model. Um, this is a model that's been pretty well validated uh, by ourselves and others. And, um, uh, it, but we don't still have, have a good idea if there's any regional biases. And so that's the first thing we did um, here. So this is just uh, some information on, on well, we here we compared uh, uh, um, so, so here on the left column is estimated false positives for the for the model, and we compared it to Calypso data to try to get this value. So, so if the red points here are the estimated false positives, and they're gathered when Calypso aerosol layers are not observed, uh, but where fl the flex part carbon model black carbon is greater than 150 nanograms per meter cube. So, in polluted aerosol layers. Um, and so most of the time, so what we're looking here for here is whether there is regional clumping of the data. And we do see a little bit of that occurring over the lowest uh, altitude level that we looked at in the study, between 0.6 and 1.5 kilometers. But in, at the other altitude layers, there isn't any consistent uh, bias. And so that's a good thing. 
And then over on the right two columns, those are the estimated false negatives. Again, the red points are what we're looking at and we're looking for clustering of the data. Um, this is a little trickier to, to constrain. Um, we don't have a good idea of how thick a, an aerosol layer has to be and how that might be related to model black carbon levels. So we kind of did an upper and lower range of what values could be. Um, and the important thing here is just that, again, we don't see a lot of clustering of the data except perhaps at the lowest um, bin level. So this is good. Um, and in fact, I, I, as far as I know, this model has never been compared to the Calypso data. And so I, th I was actually quite, <clears throat> quite pleased with these data, <clears throat> how well they compare. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so here's uh, um, the differences in cloud fraction over two different regions. We have the sea ice regions on the left. Um, and so what we did here is we just averaged all values in, in this dark gray. Um, <clears throat> and that's the, the black lines here. And this is for fall, winter, and spring. And then on, on the right, we show where the open ocean regions are during the three seasons. And again, we, we average the values between there. And here, so this is altitude on the y-axis. On the x-axis is the cloud fraction change. Um, first in the left column, it's with respect to clean clouds. And in the right column, it's the absolute change in cloud fraction. And so we did see uh, that there were changes. So aerosols were affecting cloud fraction um, on a regional scale. The effect at swi uh, switch signs, which is kind of interesting, um, somewhere between two and four kilometers, uh, you, we, went, we saw uh, clouds going from a reduced, the reduced aerosols reducing cloud fraction to enhancing cloud fraction. And um, it's difficult to know for sure what that might be. We have some interesting hypotheses. Um, and, but for the clouds above around four kilometers, these are pretty much all ice clouds. So we know that these affect the aerosols, I'm sorry, are directly affecting ice clouds somehow. And perhaps um, they might be acting as ice nuclei or some other mechanism. Um, we notice that the changes are largest in spring over sea ice. Um, and, and this is consistent with what we might expect because we have, during, during this time, we have high aerosol concentrations. We have a stable boundary layers where the um, aerosols and the moisture are trapped together. And, um, so the, and we've seen, seen that in previous studies as well. So um, this is uh, MERA model two temperature uh, plotted against the Calypso cloud fraction. This is the differences between the all and clean only conditions. And so we we're just curious, with, was there any differences with temperature? And so the, this again, this is model temperature, it's not true temperature, but generally the model should be good as far as I understand it between plus or minus five degrees <clears throat> Celsius. So um, we see that there are systematically larger differences between the clean and all cloud cases. So perhaps this might be because these aerosols are acting as like ice nucleating particles or it could be some other mechanism. Um, so just to summarize, uh, during polar night, we did see that aerosols are associated with changes in cloud fraction, <clears throat> specific, especially over sea ice. And uh, the effects are enhanced over sea ice, we think possibly because it's a stable, more stable atmosphere. There's a long cloud lifetime over the sea ice. Um, there's coincident timing of winter and spring aerosols. Um, we see this altitude related shift in the sign of the effect of the cloud fraction. And on average, uh, the aerosol impacted processes in the ice phase clouds increase, increase the cloud fraction. And this is uh, you know, present over in the entire region. And um, so, so that's it. I, before I finish, I just want to mention that I'm going to be presenting this at a session that I'm co-convening on Friday. And uh, there's going to be a lot of really other good sessions. It's uh, the sessions of polar atmospheric processes. So I invite you all to come to that. And um, yeah, and this work was funded by NASA. And um, it's really great to have these data that over, that, uh, over large regions and time periods. So thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Lauren. I, I, it's a very thought-provoking presentation. And I think it's a nice lead into the next presentation as well. Um, and again, if people have questions, please contact Lauren directly and visit her uh, during AGU to, to ask such questions. Um, the next presenter is going to be Jesse Freeman, who's going to be talking about her work on ice nucleation, something that doesn't can And we are going to run a few minutes over our scheduled end time, but hopefully most people can stick around for another five to ten minutes or so to allow Jesse to get her presentation in before we all disperse. And um, yeah, with that, Jesse, please go ahead. All right, thanks guys. Um, I'll try to be quick and respectful of your times. Um, so I'm just gonna talk briefly about a campaign that I did um, on the North Slope of Alaska this past spring and the measurements were funded by ARM. So I wanna specifically acknowledge them. And then um, ASR funding is allowing me to analyze the data from um, these measurements. 
So I don't think I need to emphasize the importance of aerosols in the Arctic to this group, but um, specifically what I'm focusing on in ice is ice nucleating particles. And these are important because they have implications for cloud formation, for cloud lifetime and precipitation. And then those types of processes then impact the amount of energy reaching the sea ice surface. So um, although we have a good general idea of the aerosols that nucleate ice, um, there's still a lot of remaining uncertainties regarding uh, model and observe Arctic ice nucleating particles or INPs. And so we really need a better understanding of these, um, these, these types of particles for more advanced observations. So um, during the spring, uh, went on a field campaign, which I'm calling INPOP or ice nucleating particles at Liktok Point. Um, so this map showing the North Slope with um, a Liktok Point highlighted in the red box. And basically the objective of this, of this study was to evaluate sources of aerosol um, predominantly found in an in, in industrial area and then the, the resulting potential of these aerosols to mod modify cloud ice. So um, Prudhoe Bay, which is highlighted in the map here, is a large Arctic oil field and Liktok Point is situated in the northwest part of this oil field. And so this is really an abundant source of really small particles formed in situ from um, these oil extraction activities. Um, so we wanted to look at what the ice nucleating potential of emissions from such a region could be. And so INPOP represents the first um, measurements of INPs in an Arctic oil field location. Um, so this is a picture of the um, DOE arm AMF3 at Aliktok Point. And so um, we put a sampler um, inside the AMF3 and then the inlets shown here on the outside. Um, and so this type of sampler that I'm using is called a drum. It's a Davis rotating drum unit for monitoring and basically it collects four different size groups of aerosols and it collects daily samples and we had this instrument deployed from the beginning of March till the end of May. Um, and so this picture here in the middle is just showing what one of these stages looks like look like so the air comes in through here while this is capped and this disc will rotate slowly over time and collect aerosol loading. And so in this bottom right picture it's kind of hard to see on your screen but on this disk, you can see kind of this cloudy white stuff on the edge of the disk, and that's actually aerosol loading from one day's observations. Um, so what we do after collection, just briefly, um, we take these samples, we suspend the particles in ultra pure water, and then I do this technique called drop freezing assays or DFAs, and so this video here is showing how this technique is done. So we basically freeze droplets on a cold plate record the temperature of these droplets, and then we can use this information to infer what type of ice nucleating particles are present in the samples that we collected. Um, so I have some very preliminary results, um, but if you wanna know more, you can come to my poster at AGU on Monday morning. Um, but basically this picture here is showing what a typical cumulative ice nucleating particle spectrum looks like. So with temperature on the bottom axis and calculated INP concentration on the left axis. And so, I um, want to highlight these gray lines here. So that is typical of what we observe for most of the samples at Electoc Point. And this is specifically for these larger 3 to 12 micron particles. Um, but these colored lines represent some really interesting case study that I'll kind of go into in a little bit here. Um, so stepping down, oh, I put the wrong animation, but looking at the size down, we see a decrease in these lines shifting to the left. So that basically means these ice nucleating particles are not nucleating ices as, at as warmer temperatures and there's not as many of them. And then stepping down in size to the 0.34 to 1.2 micron particles, that's kind of falling even lower. And then going to the smallest size particles of aerosols, uh, we're really not seeing that efficient of ice nucleating particles relative to the rest of the campaign. Um, and in general, these are pretty low concentrations and low nucleating temperatures. So um, this colored case study is really interesting because these are more efficient and warmer temperature ice nucleating particles than what I would expect. So basically anything above negative 10 to negative 15 is a biological ice nucleating particle, um, which is kind of odd for a Liktok point. Um, but what we noticed during specifically this time period with these colored lines is that the sea ice started to open up um, just west of Alaska and started to propagate towards the north coast of Alaska. So um, with an initial look at winds, I think what could be happening is that we're getting some marine influence at Electoc Point, and um, we have a lot of other analysis to do to look at if there's some terrestrial sources potentially during this time period as well, because at the beginning of the campaign, everything was snow and ice covered, so we wouldn't expect those sources to be dominant. 
Um, so just generally what we've initially observed um, is these larger warm temperature ice nucleating particles, which are likely of biological origin, were um, observed from open water in this late May time period. Um, so those were very preliminary. We have a lot to do um, for this study. So first I want to evaluate the IMPs in the context of ground-based aerosol and meteorological measurements from ARM and then look at air mass trajectory analysis to see really where um, these interesting cases were coming from. Um, and so specifically looking at that May case and the possible contribution of biological IMPs to the Elictoc region. Um, and then analyze more samples um, that I collected to see if these INPs increase when we see um, uh, more predominant open water and vegetation sources. Um, so there's an extremely brief overview. Thanks for giving me your time. And if you want to know more, come to my poster on Monday. Great, Jesse. Thank you very much. Um, appreciate you sharing those results with us, those early results. And again, please find Jesse at AGU or by email to, to ask her for more details. Um, so that is the end of our presentations, and I, I don't believe that we have um, other updates as sometimes we do at our meetings scheduled for today. Um, so what I think I will do, unless Ashley or Barry have other ideas, is um, I think I will uh, move to close this meeting. We're a couple minutes past our end time already. And um, please look for updates from the group uh, for a January meeting, which will be back at our normal towards the end of the month uh, time specifically. So, um, Sarah, did you have any other points before we cut out here? I do not. Um, have a great week next week at AGU. Okay. So, thank you, everybody, for joining us, and thank you to all the presenters for these, these really interesting presentations, and we will see you all again next month, if not before. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.